other there's, no, there's, not, there's other or, there's other organizations that that um, wanted to start chapters here. It, it's sort of formidable task. It really is. And, and so I went to the launch of uh, of NARAP and and uh, and the governor was there, I believe, and, and the the uh, lieutenant governor. And I was really impressed. But you know, a press conference is one thing. Then actually able, being able to pull it off is very challenging, especially in a in a profession that uh, you know I wasn't aware there was that many Latinos in the profession. So, uh, so when I when I uh, when I I saw EG there, I, I really uh, I really had a lot of questions about her. I didn't I've I've never really talked to her in, in depth about her background, and I thought this would be a good opportunity to. Uh, to, uh, to talk to her, but first of all, she's uh, currently a, a, a member of the Board of Directors of Minnesota Realtors. She's um, uh, a top producing agent for Keller Williams Integrity Realty in Roseville. I saw that sign on Facebook oh. in, your, in your yard. Yeah. We have to. Right, right? Yeah, congratulations on that. Thank you. And also, and here's, the, here's the, the part we're gonna talk about this morning. She was the a chapter president and founder of the in, uh, 29, <coughs> 2019 and 2020 of the National Association of Hispanic Real Estate Professional, NARAP, Twin Cities chapter. So she was the first president. I think that uh, <coughs> I think that the uh, the group made a, a great selection, put a Latina in there. <laughs> I'll be putting the guy in there for the first launch, man. <coughs> right, Ed? Right, Isaac? Andy? Carmen, right? Yes. So they, so, 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 AJ, if, if you could, you know, uh, when did you enter the real estate profession? When did you first get started? Um, I just started in 2013 when the market started coming up again, and that was uh, that was hard, you know, getting into the real estate after you have a profession before. It is kind of what I'm gonna get, what I'm what I'm going into. And um, when I started, I see there is not a lot of Latinos involved in real estate. Like they sell homes, they listed, but they are not involved in real estate. What do you mean better than all this? Okay. Yeah. And, and, and what, what profession were you, were you before that? Before real estate, um, I'm an engineer in computer science. So um, I used to work in IT and education. So basically, uh, when I came here like 20 years ago from Mexico, I have to start and I have to learn English, so I'm sorry my English, but I can do better in Spanish, I just speak Spanish. Um, I'm more fluent, I mean, um, so I came here, I have to learn the language, even though I know how to write, I know how to read, but speaking up is like, what? I didn't understand nothing. So I get myself self-educated. I say I have to learn the language as soon as I can do my career and continue being a professional. So basically, uh, I spent like up eight months or a year by myself writing newspapers, listening. I never put anything in Spanish, so I forced myself basically to learn the language and, um, and I start looking for a job. And be a woman engineer is like you have to know how to do one thing. And in Mexico, if people know you are an engineer, you can do whatever you want. You can do a lot of areas. But here they say you have to have one thing. And I was kind of, oh my gosh, what I can do? So someday somebody invited me to give classes, computer classes, in the after school program in one of the, in Abraham Lincoln High School. You know, you know that school. And I said, well, I'm gonna do it to the Hispanic kids. And I said, even better, I can learn Spanish. <laughs> so I went there and I think I've been so lucky finding good people around me all the time. So I start teaching computer classes and those kids doesn't have a clue, you know. They came as a newcomers. The state put a lot of hard um, tests to know the levels and all this stuff. And I was, what is this like that? I was so disappointed because the kids came scared and they sit down in a computer and you tell them as soon as you take the test, they wanna know your level of education. So I give myself the point to help them and, um, and that's how I started in the education field. So, let me, let me ask you this uh, yep. because uh, 
you know, coming in here challenged, challenged by the language and, 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 and also understanding <coughs> um, the challenge of, of following an international chapter from, from a very successful group, I would, I would say. Uh, NARAP's been around them many years, but we've never had it. Now, what, what, how, how did you decide that you would want to be the president? I mean, that's a big step. Well, that's the thing. I didn't decide it. But somehow, I mean, somehow you landed in that position. That's what yes. I found fascinating. Yep. That you would, you know, being a newcomer to the city here. And but that, what, tell us a little bit about that, Kiki, because I, I think that's fascinating. You know, what, what goes through somebody's mind when you're going to be taking on that challenge? Yeah. Um, well, I started real estate and I started looking around people. And um, I know Ed Luna, he's one of the founders. He's sitting right there. And um, after I've been working with him for a couple of years, um, he was Minnesota Housing at that time. <clears throat> and then Minnesota Housing sent him to one of the conference, NAREP conference in San Diego. So one day he said, Hey, Guille, look this. And I was looking the mission, cash me up right away because the mission of NAREP is educating professional, um, helping political issues, and helping professional to be connection with each other. So they say, well, this is sounds so good. In real estate, we really need it. We need um, helping each other to succeed in this business. So Ed and I, we started in 2018. Um, meeting and meeting and meeting. So starting a board, whoever is in a board is not easy. It is uh, too many regulations, too many rules, and I didn't have a clue, honestly. If I didn't know how to speak English, I didn't know how to start a board here, right here. But we have the lucky to have uh, really good um, advisors and support, like Trent, he was already having experience in, in boards. Andy, when I just started the, the board, I just moved to Keller Williams. I found the support right there more than anything, and the sponsors and everything. So as soon as we have the board, we, we invite a lot of people. But believe me, nobody is willing to be right there in every single meeting trying to make a change. Because this is not just a group having fun and being the Latino real estate. It's a lot of stuff that we have to do. Um, like I always say, I'm not a political person, but then I learned and I have to know political. I have to know, I have to learn. So when we have the board and we have everything, we vote. And they were so gladly to tell me, Gije, you're gonna be the next president. <laughs> um, <clears throat> and I was, so I still in this moment, I cannot say thank you enough because NAREP opened doors. NAREP, I've been knocking doors since I started real estate agent. I've been knocking nonprofit. Hey, we missed this. We need this in the industry. We need this. Nobody even, I said, oh, Guille, you are so new. You want to get custom to this. Uh, and I say, no, I mean, we need help. We need make changes. And nobody's putting attention. So when that happened, NAREP, somebody told me, Oh, now you have a platform. I mean, seriously. I mean, thank you so much, but yes, I do. Um, so we started, and that was in 2019 when we launched the, the first event. And we have around 250 people in the inauguration. That was a success. We have vice president, we have VPs, we have lenders, we have uh, community leaders, and everybody uh, then we invite whoever take us seriously came to the meeting. Well, <laughs> came I, to I, the. I, I want to ask about that because uh, I mean, that, that was a surprise. Uh, first of all, organizing the board because when I went to that, the governor's uh, reception and or the, mm -hmm. the press conference, rather, yes, you know, I was impressed with your board. I, I, I but I was thinking uh, a lot of women on the board. I said, this thing might work. Yes. So I, 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 I want to just close with this, and, and uh, there's one thing about starting a national chapter and then finding out all the responsibilities, because I, I think Gary Acosta is a player. Right? Yes. Very serious for him. But for all the challenges you just described, 
to actually become Rookie of the Year nationally? Yes. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Well, yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. That one was a surprise for us because in 2020, no, 2019, that was when NAREP was 20 years older. You know, they were celebrating the 20 years. And I didn't have a clue that NAREP exists. So when that happens, that means that they were bringing a lot of technology, marketing. They were doing the boom for NAREP nationally. So if I'm not mistaken, that year, that was about 30 chapters then open it. So, and we were awarded with the Rookie of the Year. Um, but that one is because we really find people who cares about the community, who cares about the mission that we are working at. And, um, and the all board members, they were so compromised. And like Keller Williams say, if it's not in the agenda, it doesn't exist. So we put NAREP in our agenda and we make it work and here we are. So we were awarded with the Rookie of the Year and, um, and everybody was so happy because all the work that we did was already recognizing. And being nationally recognizing, it is something. Yeah, and, again, yeah. and I just, I just want to say the sponsors, the sponsors that we had and then we still have that makes a huge difference because um, without money, you know, we cannot go anywhere. I mean, so, but we are financially well done. And one thing that is so important, we don't manage the money. National is so well organized, then we don't touch any money. So that's one thing that I really love it about NAREP because it's not, we know where the money goes, but we don't manage the money. And, and that's, I think that's better. It creates a lot of credibility so in how we do it. Let's close with this because we're going to break up Isaac. But yeah. I, 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 was, I was challenged by doing a, a live conference, to be honest with you. Gentlemen. Most of the companies that I called I weren't interested in doing live yet. Uh, they wanted to, but uh, there's still that, and, and we kind of know that out there. So um, I, I was thinking about Andy and, and Isaac and uh, and the fact that we wanted to talk about real estate, but I, but I also see that a lot of the people from NAREP are here. And, and thanks, yep. thanks, EG and, and, and Isaac and Andy, that you know we could, we could turn to your organization and you're able to bring some more attendees here because uh, uh, we, really, we really respect that. And uh, so I, I think we had a great conversation with EG. You got Thank you. Okay. And, uh, and at, at this time, we're, we're going to bring up a good friend of mine that uh, yeah, we grew up together right here in the neighborhood. And throughout his uh, throughout his career uh, to date, you know, he's been involved in, 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 a, in a lot of different uh, businesses in the sense that they were challenging businesses. Uh -huh. it, it was nothing that uh, you could take a, a eight. Eight to five or eight to four gig, and then it's, it's you know you got the bologna sandwich, and then you're good, right? <laughs> no, no. This guy was always challenged, so it, it's remarkable that he's here in this in this position now. Not only uh, top produ producing agent with Keller Williams, of course, and got the lawn sign right. I got the lawn sign. Two lawn <laughs> here. Let's have a hand for those lawn signs. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But 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 you're the current. President Correct. NAREP. Correct. I mean, you took that over, and uh, uh, first of all, EG, I, I didn't mention it, but thanks for surviving yes. 2020. I mean, the yeah. virtual thing, talking about being hired to be the president, then you had to take that to its the yeah, challenge. Yeah, absolutely. You did it successfully. So now we're gonna we're gonna turn to Isaac here, and um, and um, uh, your challenge is you gotta you, you gotta. You got to see what she did. Yeah, she absolutely. Did. And, uh, but I think you will. And uh, Isaac, let's let's hear from you now. NAREP present time and, and what's yeah. the future looking like? Absolutely. Isaac, <laughs> Yeah, we're, we're very excited about uh, what 2021 looks like and what uh, 2022 is going to look like uh, as we move forward. Because with the help of Gigi and the help of Ed, 
really solidifying that foundation and that board, um, it was a tremendous place to lift off from. Um, I joined NAREP right when it started up, uh, the chapter, which is, as she mentioned, it's one of 30 chapters that were created that year. And nationally, it's over 30, well, maybe almost 40,000 members now nationally and over 100 chapters. So getting a chapter here was a huge deal. Like there is so much respect that I have for that because we are flyover country. And when you look at it nationally, Minnesota is not considered a Hispanic marketplace, a big Hispanic marketplace. When I was in the Navy, nobody in the six years that I was in ever guessed that I was from Minnesota. Weird, right? <laughs> and so having that experience and understanding that, being able to create that was such a huge, huge accomplishment. And so we're grateful for that. And one of the big reasons that it was important for me to be a part of NAREP as a member, I joined as a member, so I was there at that party, it was a great party, um, was that when we came out of, I was a loan officer during, uh, right before the bubble. In 2008, I was a loan officer in 9, 10, and my business didn't survive. A lot of folks' business didn't survive. So when I found out about NAREP Twin Cities chapter, that was a big deal because now that the Hispanic community was coming out of the housing bubble, right, that the Great Recession, we, I mean, we were beat up. We, we definitely got beat up just like everybody else, but, you know, naturally I'm biased. I'm going to say we got beat up a little bit more, and there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, but when we came out of that ready to buy again, which we have shown to do that because for the last six years, the Hispanic community, the Hispanic home buyer has led the nation in home ownership rate increases for the last six years. And that's tremendous because even though that gap that, that uh, uh, Andy was talking about, we're still behind nationally, we're still behind in, in, in that gap, but the rate of increase, the rate of growth, we have led the nation as this cohort in, in that for six straight years, and that's a big deal, okay? And so when we come out of that type of a scenario, and we saw some of it in 2020 when we were, I was, I was fortunate enough to be asked to be the vice president during 2020, and this is one of the things that we talked about. Um, during 2020 and the health crisis and the economic crisis, our folks are, are we're getting beat up again. Um, the unemployment rate is high in the Hispanic community, and a lot of that has to do with us being overrepresented in the, in the service industry. So no hotels, a lot of our folks are unemployed. No restaurants, a lot of our folks are unemployed. Different service industries like that. So we had a higher percentage of unemployment than most other demographics. But we are also willing to move. We're willing to move to different states where there is better uh, employment. Where there, and, and we've got a Hispanic uh, home ownership study that, I, that I have here. You can't have this copy because it's all marked up from my notes. <laughs> but I can get you a copy of that as well as a Hispanic uh, um, wealth uh, information, right? Uh, the Hispanic Wealth Project. And so that information is available to you. Please let me know. Give me your card. I'll make sure you get a copy of it. If you want a hard copy, we'll get that set up for you as well. So the information is out there. But one of the things that we discovered is that we are mobile, okay? We will move to states that have better employment and better housing opportunity, okay? We are working, if you look at uh, um, what's projected for the next few years, for the next 10 years, the Hispanic population is gonna have uh, a presence of 68% of the working labor growth over the next 10 years. And that's not my number. That's from the US, uh, that's from the US uh, Department of Labor, okay? And we wanna buy sooner. This 2020 COVID, when we, when some of the things that we've learned from 2020 getting beat up again. Um, it changed the way we're looking at things. We're ready to buy sooner than we had been before. We're ready to buy, uh, uh, we'll, we're ready to drive to that location, meaning we're ready to commute further. We're ready to go to where there's housing opportunities. We're also ready to buy bigger. And what I mean by bigger is that we tend to be a higher percentage of multi-generational purchasers. So we will buy a house, and this, and you see this when you're out showing houses. As a real estate agent, you're out showing houses. You can tell when a Latino uh, uh, buyer's coming up because it's not just one. 
<laughs> they're bringing their tia. <laughs> Sometimes they're bringing their grandpa. And they're bringing the kids. They're running around the yard. But it's multi-generational. So they, when they're looking at homes, they're not looking at just uh, 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 you know, two bedrooms and a place where I can work from home. We're not working from home as a, as a, a, in general. We need a place that we can fit my, 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 my grandkids and my kid and his, and his wife, my mom and dad. That's like, that's, I'm a, you know, that ter stereotype or that, that's a, <laughs> that uh, uh, profile because that's exactly what I'm doing in my life. I'm looking for a home that's going to fit my in-laws and my grandkids, right? That's how we buy. So when we're coming out of this 2020 as a national organization, now we're the chapter, right? Reflecting on the 2008 housing bubble, one of the things that we, we recognized was that our presence as the professionals, the loan officers, the real estate agents, the title companies, was diminished as well, right? So having learned that lesson, our chapter, we pushed very hard to make sure that not only did we survive this health crisis, this economic crisis, right, as independent contractors, as business owners, but we also thrived. That we showed that not only were we here able to conduct business, but we were able to do it at a greater, at a greater capacity than most. Because our industry, relatively th through the, the economic crisis so far, we've been unscathed. Um, the real estate industry, what, refinances are out the roof, our loan officers, our mortgage uh, representatives can, uh, can attest to that. And then the home purchasing. You see that low inventory and that high demand. Everything's getting scooped up. So it was important that once our community got back to work and continued to show that strength, that when they looked around, they could see other folks that represented them as well. And so that's one of our missions, or not one of our missions, that's one of our tasks at the chapter because our mission is to advance sustainable Hispanic home ownership. And we do that as a trade organization made up of other real estate practitioners, real estate agents. And most of our, uh, our, our chapter is made up of real estate agents and nationally as well. It's about 85% of the members are real estate agents and then about 10% are mortgage originators and then another 5% is a mixture of other auxiliary services, right? And so coming out of this economic crisis, coming out of this health crisis, we had to make sure that not only did we survive, but that we thrive because the Latino population is poised to be the leading factor in the economic growth. We are buying more houses, we're buying bigger houses, we're buying them faster and we're ready to go wherever it is. Now, all of that matters because out of this report, which is a national report, the question is, what does, it man, what does it mean to us locally, right? We've got folks here who bi do business here locally in the Twin Cities market. What does that mean as far as the, mar uh, the Hispanic buying power, the, what the market is doing here? Well, a couple of interesting things that I, that I discovered in that mobility piece. <clears throat> Minnesota, we have, we're in the top third in the Hispanic population. We're in the top third of the country as far as medium in, median income. Now that's a big deal because you've got other big, you know, tremendous uh, 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 Hispanic populated uh, states like the New Yorks, the Texas, the, the Floridas, the ones you really always think about. But we're in the top third, Minnesota, flyover country. This is a testament to how difficult it was to get a local chapter here from the national organization to see that market here in the Twin Cities. The other thing is when I talk about that mobility is we are also, as far as positive net migration, where are the Latinos moving to, okay? Most folks immediately think Texas, which is true. Um, Nevada or Florida or uh, 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 New York, things like that, I, uh, states like that. We are doing, we have a positive net growth in migration of higher than 34 other states in the country, including New York, California, and Michigan. Could you say why that is? Good, good question. And the two big factors is 
One, there's a better housing market in some of these areas here in the Twin Cities, and maybe not in Egan or, <laughs> or Bloomington, but in Winona, in Richfield, in Worthington, where there's a high population. Believe it or not, um, the highest population per capita in the state of Minnesota of Latinos is Worthington. Absolutely. And there's a, and correct, there's jobs. We're willing to work. And this is what makes us such a huge factor in this economic uh, recovery because we as a population are young. We tend to be, on average, about 14 years younger than our non-Hispanic white counterparts. And now we are in our prime home buying years. Right now, there's 8.3 million mortgage-ready Latinos. Now that's a big deal when you can say mortgage-ready because that credit's there, the work's there, the history's there. 8.3 million mortgage-ready Latinos under the age of 45 prime home buying years. And so we have that opportunity and we are in position to move us out of help push the whole country out of this economic crisis that we've been experiencing. Let us get back to work, open up the restaurants, open up the, <laughs> open up the, the hotels, things like that. We'll get back to work and we'll do that. And, and we're, we're that big factor. So much so that uh, uh, Urban Institute, no, I'm sorry, Freddie Mac has had done their numbers and they're projecting that the Latino community is gonna be 70% for the next 20 years, 70% of all new home buyers. All new home purchases are gonna be, 70% uh, of them are gonna be Latino. That's a big, big, big impact. So this cohort is projected, or is, is, is in position to be able to do that. Not just nationally, but locally, because they're moving here. We got, we're making more money. Like I said, we're in the top third median income in, uh, of all the states which is a big factor, especially in flyover country. Um, we're young, okay? And while you, if, you, if you watch too much news, right, <laughs> you may think we're not U.S. born, but 67%, according to the U.S. Census Bureau, 67%, just over that, are U.S. born. So there's some of those obstacles that you have to overcome being a new immigrant are already taken care of. Credit and, and, and establishing uh, uh, residence, things like that. All of those things are already taken care of. So that positions us into that, uh, uh, being that driving factor to come out of the economic. So we still have some challenges though. Low inventory, everybody knows about that. If you've even glanced at a newspaper, you know about the low inventory, right? Um, there's some challenges with credit obstacles. Right? We tend to have a multi-generational multi household. So when we're being looked at for credit to be able to borrow money to buy a house, lots of times, traditionally, you're only looking at the head of household or the spouse, the two leaders in the, in the house. But we've got income coming from my, you know, my son who's renting the, uh, 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 the rooms or, or grandma and grandpa who are contributing. Those are non-traditional sources of income. That's an obstacle that we, we need to get recognized and to be able, and, and this is some of the policy that uh, Gigi was mentioning that we have to drive because all those numbers are, are economic numbers, right? And what we discovered in NAREP is that economic power is what drives policy. So if we can present that in, a, in, the, in the right way, which Gary does a fantastic job because on Capitol Hill in Washington, they, when they make policy, they're reaching out to NAREP. Some of the items that you saw in the, uh, the Recovery Acts were from consultations and advisement from NAREP and the leadership at NAREP. So they're doing that on a national level, we're doing that on a local level. We're involved in the, 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 the trade organizations, okay? As members, we have uh, members who've been city council members um, we have members who are on commissions, um, governmental affairs. What we've created, yeah, this year is the first year that we have 
a committee specifically dedicated to that, the Governmental Affairs Committee. And it's, and it's to influence and be present during policy decisions. We're not trying to be political, but we have to be politically savvy, right? Whoever's in office comes and goes, but the policies remain. And so we want to be able to get into those, uh, uh, those rooms where decisions are made, okay? And we want to be able to present things with, with that Latino mindset, understanding the Latino ecosphere, right? And so all of those pieces are a huge factor and are going to influence that moving forward. So we talked about uh, uh, credit, we talked about low inventory, um, we talked, there's a couple other things, but one of the things is presence, our representation. One of the things, we, we need to be able to have an impact and representation, and so this is part of the reason why some, of the, some folks are here. They want to know, how do I get another Hispanic real estate agent? How do I get another Hispanic title or a closer, uh, 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 a loan officer to be able to service this tremendous market that's available to us, right? Because one of the things discovered is that, and, and it may not seem, you know, like you just invented sliced bread, but when you, when you do realize that the market share increases with the appropriate representation, that matters, right? And so that's a driving factor. So we're looking to continue to do that, and we do that with NAREP and our, and our, and our, uh, uh, our membership. So we identify our members, we identify what they're doing aside from just the transaction, okay? Because we are involved in different policy uh, uh, committees, policy generating committees, we are involved in different commissions, we are involved in, uh, we have seats across uh, different organizations, right? What is that, what, what are, what, identifying what is our uh, membership up to? The other piece is promoting that, okay? One of the great things that we're going to have is right now, last uh, yesterday, nationally, the NAREP 250 for loan originators was released. All right? So NAREP 250, what that is is that NAREP nationally is recognizing the top 250 loan originators nationally. Now, our presence is a Minnesota chapter, right, on a national scale, and especially when we're competing against Californias and Floridas, things like that, um, is, is small. I'm not going to try to say we, you know, we've taken up 25% of that or anything like that. Over the last few years, we've had one or two uh, folks from Minnesota who have landed on that 250. This year, not only did we land on that with, we got one person on the two, national 250, but we also have uh, uh, two people two uh, uh, um, from Minnesota who landed on the one, top 100 telesales because now we know that mortgages are a national thing. You can be in, in your house in the basement in, in uh, Arkansas and still <laughs> write loans in Minnesota, right? But nationally, two, two of them, and they're from Wells Fargo, which is a huge deal. Thank you, Wells Fargo. They're a sponsor as well. But they do great work in understanding the market. And two of our... Uh, um, Minnesota folks landed on the top 100 tele, telesales list, and then we had another two that landed on the top 100, or I'm sorry, the top 50 for the Midwest region, which is a big deal as well because now we're competing against traditionally high Hispanic uh, markets like Chicago. Absolutely, and I appreciate that. And, that's, and see, that's a call to action for us. That is a tremendous call to action for us because we have our sponsors asking us, how do we get more folks? How do we increase this number within our own organization? 
And that's one of the things that we're doing with, like I said, we identify, we promote, or we, and then we place. And being able to establish that credibility, being able to establish our presence, okay, that has its impacts within the, the Latino community because when we go to ask who should we do business with, right, when you go to, when you go to a family reunion and you ask, well, where should I get my, my, my chorizo con huevos, right, where should I get breakfast? They'll, they don't say go to, you know, go to Perkins or something like that. They say go to El Burrito, right? They have the best. And then Uncle, <laughs> Uncle John and, <laughs> and Tia Carla are going to debate who has the best, right? Because they have their favorite and there's that high level of loyalty, right? So once you get in with one family, they talk about you and you treat them right, right? It's got to be that trust factor there because that trust factor, it's transparent. It'll see you right through you, right? But once you establish that, it's also generational because now you're talking to not only, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Buyer, but you're also talking to their grandparents, their tias, and then their kids. Like I said, to Ben's point, the average loan officer in his organization is 52 years old. Or, I'm sorry, 55. We are young. We're coming up. We're establishing. And we are better home buyers, or we tend to be higher, uh, not better home buyers. We tend to be more active home buyers because we're getting into the workforce early. Now, unfortunately, we do have a low education gap, post secondary education. It's low, but that means we're in the, we're in the buy or we're in the workforce sooner and we have less student debt. That's one of the all big factors as well. Some folks aren't able to get into a home because student debt is just destroying their DTI, their, their, their ability to buy. Well, when we have the lowest factor as a community, that, imp that elevates us to be able to get into those homes sooner. And that's what puts us at that mortgage ready at less than 45. So a lot of information, right? These are the things that we're doing. We're, we're growing, we're pushing hard. Uh, we do feel like we have a responsibility and we are held accountable, okay? And we're very humble, <laughs> you can tell. Amen. This is our leader, <laughs> all right? Thank you so much. Amen. Hey, thanks, look, Rick, 25 years, fantastic. I love this. Thank you so much. Wow. Yeah, you got a question. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, well, good question. Um, when, it, when I was talking about policy, like what are we, what kind of policy or what policies are we trying to impact? Is it just the lending side, right? Or is it other, other places as well, right? So yes, the answer is yes on the lending side because we want lenders to be able to recognize non-traditional income, for, for example. Also to understand that as a, a, a demographic, our, in, our credit scores tend to be lower, right? We're still learning. We're coming from countries that did not have credit scores. And so even our parents aren't teaching us about those correctly, because, or not correctly, just not at all, because we didn't understand that. And then also, um, but on the policy side, on the government side, at the national level, things like, um, um, for example, the, uh, the ITIN, the Individual Tax Identification Number. That's a number that's used aside from the, the uh, Social Security number, right, in place of that, so that the person can pay taxes. Now, at the national level, that's where that's, where that's managed. Um, as far as whether or not that we can use that as a lender to borrow against, right? Because a lot of those times they're government-backed loans. Now, for four years, ITINs weren't allowed to be used. Three or four years? Four, and DACA as well. And DACA as well, right? The Dreamers Act. But the day before inauguration, this past inauguration, one of the outgoing directors signed off on that letter, signed off on the memo, whatever it is he signed off on, right? We're, I don't care. It was done. And when he said, when he signed off saying that 
FHA could now could be used for ITIN borrowers that open that back up. I'm sorry, just for DACA. Correct, correct. I'm sorry, I got a couple things going. <laughs> but for DACA, that opened that up for a whole new set of buyers. And that was a big thing. So that's the type of policy nationally we're looking for. But we're also looking to have impact on things locally, going to city councils and changing or having zoning laws adjusted, right? From too many, you know, right now you ha it's mostly single family homes. But if we can get those adjusted to look forward and be multifamily homes, whether it's one or, or three or four, things like that within the same space, or even multiple uh, uh, how, uh, uh, structures on a particular piece of land, those kinds of things make it uh, uh, favorable, correct. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you.